Tonight on To The Point. Proposition 1 still too close to call. What both sides want people to do as more ballots are counted. A body found tonight in the Calaveras River amid the search for a missing student. The latest on the investigation. Plus neighbors waking up to more than 20 oak trees destroyed. Was it legal? And later we go inside to a first of its kind program where local students are learning how to convert low riders into electric cars. But first tonight, breaking news just into the newsroom. The San Joaquin medical examiner says a body found in the Calaveras River earlier today is missing Stag High School student Xavier Martinez. It is a heartbreaking update to this search. He went missing last Wednesday when he allegedly jumped into the river following a fight at the school. An independent diver spotted the body this morning and the sheriff's office was able to help recover it. The school district says that counselors will be available to help family, friends, students, and of course the community. And if you have ever wondered if your vote counts tonight, we can tell you that it does. The yes and no votes for Prop 1, Governor Newsom's mental health ballot initiative, are so close that the no campaign took back the concession that they made last week. And Becca Hobbegger is in studio tonight with the current vote count and what both sides are doing to try to secure that win, Becca, right? Yeah, Alex, you know, currently statewide, yes on Prop 1 and no are separated by fewer than 20 3,000 votes, according to the Secretary of State's office. Now, some counties are closer than others in our more conservative counties. You can see a more decisive vote on no at this point. Uh, but if you take a look at places like Sacramento County, it's very evenly split. As of the latest vote count update just a couple of hours ago, the difference is fewer than 1,300 with yes in the lead. In fact, it was separated by just 100 this morning, but yes votes increased with this afternoon's update. Now, the close race is why Prop 1 opponents aren't giving up. On March 12th, a week after the California primary, opponents of Prop 1 conceded their loss, saying as the principal opponents of Prop 1, we concede that it is almost certain to pass. But six days later, on Monday, opponents revived their campaign, their website now urging supporters to make sure their ballot got accepted and counted and, if not, to fix the issue. Why? For one, the vote narrowed going into the weekend, fewer than 20,000 votes separating yes and no, though yes has since strengthened its lead. But also, the nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization Cal Matters reported on Monday Newsom's Political Action Committee put out an appeal late last week for volunteers to reach out to Democrats who had their ballots rejected for mismatched signatures or other reasons to fix them and get them counted. In response, Paul Simmons, a director of Californians Against Prop 1, said in a statement, We know many Democrats voted against Prop 1, so the governor's effort is no slam dunk. If you're a Republican or independent, we want you to know that your ballot might make the difference in this election. If your ballot was rejected, don't ignore the notice, fix it. But how big of a problem is this? Well, Sacramento County has one of the lowest uh, rates of challenged ballots in the state. Um, more than 99% of our ballots are counted without issue. Um, and then a few of them have either mismatched signatures or no signatures. Uh, so we have to work with voters to get those cured. Ken Kasparis is a spokesperson for Sacramento County. He says the county will notify any voter whose ballot has a signature issue and they have until March 31st to fix it. First, we'll send them a letter and those letters are available in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese. If we have other contact information like a phone number or an email address, we'll also try and reach out to them that way. We have around 42,000 ballots statewide that need to be cured, meaning that they need to have either a signature for somebody who forgot to sign it or a fixed signature for a signature that the county registrar wasn't able to match to a registration card or a driver's license. Paul Mitchell with Political Data Inc. says we'll see if this push by both sides of Prop 1 makes a difference. Whether or not that happens in this Prop 1 race is really to be determined, but someday we'll be on talking about a local race maybe where just the act of going and make sure everybody's vote counts makes a difference between a winner and loser. Now, if you're wondering about a possible recount, experts say we're not likely to see one with Prop 1 either way the vote goes. It's expensive, it's cumbersome, and it has to be requested since there's no automatic recount in the state of California. Alex. All right, Becca, thank you so much. And there's an update tonight in the Sacramento mayoral race. One of the four front runners is now calling it quits, and it comes as ballots are still being counted. Dr. Flo Kofer is still in the lead over Kevin McCarty. Kofer with now 29% of the vote. Dr. Richard Pan is slightly behind McCarty. The two top vote getters will go on to the November general election. And tonight, Steve Hansen posted on X conceding, writing in part saying, quote, it was so close, but unfortunately, we will not be advancing to the runoff while the results released today were not what we hoped. It is not the end of our work fighting for a better Sacramento. Thank you for believing in me and my vision for what 
there our city could be. And let's take a live look at what's happening right now in Sacramento. The Sacramento City Council is meeting to vote on a controversial plan to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. This is a live look inside City Council chambers. The public and City Council are weighing in ahead of the vote. And you can see that is a completely packed room right now. And just hours ago, Mayor Steinberg addressed the public saying members of the Muslim and Jewish communities in Sacramento came together to collaborate on this resolution. The mayor says the goal is to acknowledge acknowledge the pain and each side's truth, call out the atrocities and call for the release of hostages and humanitarian aid in Gaza, among other items. I hope that this picture behind me of Jews, of Muslims, of Palestinians standing together at Old City Hall will send a message throughout our community and beyond that silence is never an option. Council member Lisa Kaplan announcing her opposition today with a statement saying in part, as a past president of the Jewish Federation, I must stand with Jewish leaders, rabbis, and Jewish community groups who oppose the current language and framework of this resolution because the current language does not bring both sides together. And tonight's meeting is just the beginning where the members of the public will be able to share their thoughts. And you already know we will continue to follow this very closely and we'll have more updates coming up tonight on Late News Tonight at 11. Now take a look at this. This is a smash and grab caught on camera in Rockland. Police are looking for six people accused of stealing motorcycles from Roseville Motorsports. Surveillance video shows that around 3.30 Monday morning, two cars and a U-Haul, they drive up to the store. Look at this. Several thieves in black hoodies loaded up and stole six dirt bikes in a matter of minutes. We believe it's the same group that's hit multiple dealerships. It's just the way that they act is very military-like. They know what they're doing. They know exactly where they're going. They bring bolt cutters and sawzalls and all this stuff. So we just hope that it stops it from happening in the future. Moore says between the stolen dirt bikes, a broken entrance and property damage, the loss totals around $100,000. And Rockland Police, they are investigating this and asking anyone with information to give them a call. And there's a recognition of our interdependence that requires of this moment that we direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. Yeah, it's hard to believe that was Governor Gavin Newsom on this day four years ago when he issued a stay at home order because of the COVID-19 pandemic. California was one of the first states to make the drastic move of urging people to stay at home and avoid going out to stop the spread. With this, all non-essential businesses and schools were forced to close. COVID has unfortunately claimed the lives of millions of people around the world since the 2020 pandemic. Next on to the point, decades of history flattened in the middle of the night. The upset from neighbors after they say oak trees were cut down without warning. Well, tonight we're going to welcome in spring, starting to feel more winter-like conditions in our 10-day forecast. Rain, snow, and cooler weather on the way. And later, where students are learning how to convert low riders into electric vehicles. Chief Meteorologist Monica Woods with your first day of spring forecast, mm -hmm. which is starting tonight, clearly, because look at the colors that we're wearing today. I know, we <laughs> we're are ready. All bright and ready for it. <laughs> we are going to see some winter-like conditions come back into the forecast temporarily. But again, this is kind of that transition season with spring beginning officially at 8.06 this evening. And that'll be our vernal equinox. Clear skies and very spring-like conditions right now throughout the region. We've got some clouds in the high country, but nothing that's producing any precipitation. Temperature trend has certainly been on the warm side. 67 degrees is our average high. We've been in the low to mid 70s for the past several days. Region-wide in the 70s up and down the valley. 58 degrees for San Francisco right now. 60s in the foothills and 50s up top for the Sierra. Tonight, we'll continue to see a beautiful evening. Light winds, temperatures holding in the 70s through 7 p.m. Shortly after that, we get into sunset and our temperatures cool into the 50s. But again, that vernal equinox just absolutely beautiful for today. Rain and snow returning, though. Timing on this, it starts up Friday. Temperatures dropping 10 to 15 degrees, and this pattern's going to stick around, it looks like potentially through Easter. So we say goodbye to that high pressure ridge, which has been bringing us the mild and dry weather. 
In comes the rain on Friday afternoon and the snow will start up as well. So we'll see some moderate impacts for this year are primarily chain controls and some travel delays up there. Highs tomorrow though in the 50s, 60s to near 70 through the foothills with highs along the coast still near 60, 70s inland and we'll take that all the way through the valley. Morning lows in the 40s, highs in the 70s with our region wide forecast showing those big changes coming our way for the first weekend of spring. We've got rain and cooler weather and it sticks around into our 10 day forecast. Light chance of showers and thunderstorms for the Valley Friday and Saturday. All right, Monica, thank you. Coming up on to the point, the work week ends for most people on Friday evening, but a new bill wants to change that. Our verified team breaks it all down. And history flattened. Neighbors in Freeport woke up without oak trees in their backyard, but was it legal? We look into that after the break. Right now, residents in this small town of Freeport are upset after they say decades of Delta history were cut down in the middle of the night. 21 Valley Oak trees that line Freeport Boulevard were chopped down to make room for a new housing development. ABC 10's Devin Truby spoke to advocates who say this may not have even been legal to do. Yeah, Alex, I want you to take a look at the 21 trees that were cut down. One of them while we were here earlier today. Now there's a specific process to cut down an oak tree to be in compliance with state law. So we looked into if this was done right. The sounds of chainsaws ripping through the midnight hours early Monday morning on Freeport Boulevard near the Freeport Wine Country Inn. There it goes. Decades of Delta history crashing to the ground. I thought that you couldn't do anything after 10 o'clock for the loudness of the noises, you know, but they did it until 3 o'clock in the morning. Leanne Maltby lives across the street on Freeport Boulevard near Freeport Wine Country Inn. This is now her view, a wasteland of valley oak trees. These trees were part of the memorial for World War II veterans that bridged from New York all the way to California. These were a very, very significant part of history of Freeport. It was a celebration of the veterans, and it was an ongoing memorial to their service to our country. Anna Swenson, the chair of the Delta Protection Committee, cannot believe her eyes. The Delta's history splintered. The trees were cut down to make room for the new housing development by KB Homes called Edgewater at Delta Shores. 81 homes will soon sit next to a golf course. According to an application and approval obtained by ABC 10, KB was approved by the city of Sacramento to remove a total of 41 oak trees with the contingency they would replace 21 of them. The city of Sacramento says the organization Trees of Sacramento did file an appeal against the removal in November. The city held a public hearing in January and rejected the appeal. We're left with kind of like a barren moonscape and that's sad. I just I can't believe that they did it. Activists say they'll be taking their concerns to city council tonight. We reached out to KB Homes, but they had no comment about this, Alex. All right, Devin, thank you. Students in the Sacramento, school, Sacramento City Unified School District could be starting school a little earlier this fall. The State Board of Education is considering whether to approve a plan that would add 16 more days over the course of two academic years. If approved before May 15th, school would start on August 19th. If approved after May 15th, the school, the first day of school would remain on August 29th, with the additional days added to the 2025-2026 school year. And the district says the plan is an opportunity to avoid $47 million in penalties for not meeting the required number of instructional days and minutes in the 2021-2022 school year. In other news, congressional leaders and the White House have reached an agreement on how to fund the Department of Homeland Security, which could help avert a government shutdown because since October, Congress has nearly shut the government down at least partially five times. This time, funding for DHS was the final major sticking point in negotiations for the six spending bills that need to be passed by Friday's deadline. The details of the negotiation have yet to be released, but lawmakers can start processing the spending package, and they are still up against the clock to get the bills to President Biden by Friday to prevent a partial government shutdown. And you might have seen the posts on social media about a proposed bill to create a four day work week. Yes, you heard that right. The bill was introduced by Senator Bernie Sanders last week to drop the standard work week from 40 hours to 32 hours. Lorenzo Hall and our Verify team look into the plans and his claims. Let's examine two of the claims he made when he introduced the bill using these resources. 
The sad reality is Americans now work more hours than the people of any other wealthy nation. That's not true, but it's close. Of the 15 wealthiest countries by GDP, only workers in Mexico and South Korea put in more hours every year than Americans do. Meanwhile, people in Japan work 204 fewer hours every year. In the UK, it's 279 hours. And in Germany, people work 470 fewer hours. Despite these long hours, the average worker in America makes almost $50 a week less than he or she did 50 years ago after adjusting for inflation. For this claim, the answer depends on which workers you consider and which time frame. Bureau of Labor Statistics data for all private sector non-farm employees go back to 1979. It shows a consistent increase over time with inflation factored in. But the senator's staff told the Nevada Independent last year that he based a similar claim on data specific to production and non-supervisory workers who are 80 percent of the workforce. In that case, it's true that those workers today earn less after inflation than they did 50 years ago, but by about $30 a week, not 50. With your Verify, I'm Lorenzo Hall. Next on To The Point, the first of its kind program teaching students to convert low riders to electric vehicles. As California transitions towards zero emission vehicles, one program at a local charter school is teaching students from historically under-resourced communities how to convert a low rider into an electric vehicle. And the school says it is the first of its kind in California. We're building a low rider, 64 Impala, into a all electric vehicle, which nobody has done with high school kids. It was Wyatt Schoen. I am a senior here at Saba, and I've been going here for about four years now. Experience with this class has been it's fun, unique, and something I'm very proud of. Saba is Sacramento Area Vocational Academy, and this is a trade school for high school students. Okay, okay we've got your turn signal. Yep. If you look around, there's a lot of stuff that everybody does, hands-on. This kind of gives us a little bit of different perspective instead of st sitting in a classroom. They're learning, but I don't think they know. EV revolution is here, and it's coming whether we like it or not. So what better way than to get these kids on a career path, potentially, that teaches them about EV, and then we catch them with the, you want to build a lowrider. I have been in the low riding community and for many many years you know with my dad helping him in the garage and so it's kind of like a generational thing bringing the project i was like my daughter has to be a part of this like this is something that i'm passing down to her since i was born i grew up being a low rider in duke's car club the music the cars i just feel super safe and protected there. Being an actual lowrider that's working on the lowrider just feels more, words can't even describe it, it's just ex super ex exciting. It's crazy to see that it's gonna be electric. I feel like not that many people already are very into electric cars. The low riding community in Sacramento is very large. There's like over 40 car clubs and then over 100 solo riders in the community. The community says these these cars are just not cool. I mean, like they just didn't, don't represent us, and so that's where the idea of bringing in a culturally relevant vehicle that's iconic to the Latino Chicano community in order to create that adoption. So the project like this, like this EV lowrider, I think really brings all of it together. It excites the community, it excites our youth, and overall, they're 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 targeting combating air pollution because really it's about them pushing the EV car forward. It means the world because I can put on my resume, I did this. You will never, for at least a couple of years, see this on anyone else's resume and I can help push this in other areas to make it a new norm. 
and the local charter school will be offering more classes like this one through their new electric vehicle pathway. It will help equip students from underrepresented communities with skills for clean energy jobs and electric vehicle adoption. And I absolutely love that story. It is so cool to see our future generation just moving us forward. And it's another reason why we love telling your stories and really getting to meet you. So if you have something that you think we should be looking into, make sure you reach out to me and the team. Remember, strangers are people we just haven't gotten to know yet, so take a little bit of time to get to know someone. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Hey, it's Alex. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. The To The Point team and I love hearing from you, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. And don't forget, you can always email me and the team at tothepoint at abc10.com, or you can even send us a text message at 916-321-3310.